Hey, a pleasant good evening, everybody. Welcome into the Philadelphia Phillies versus Miami Marlins series preview here at Sports Fanatic News. I'm Joe Boric, joined by Andrew Santangelo. Please like, comment, and subscribe. We really appreciate your support. Coming at you with the series preview, coming off of a series loss where the Phillies could not pick the ball well and also stomped themselves in the foot yet again, leaving too many runners in scoring position in the two games that they lost. So, Andrew, on those two key points before we even go into the matchups, don't you think, one, this series, that's when this really was the first big series was an issue. You have to pick the ball first and foremost to win games, but you also have to figure out a way to more consistently score with runners in scoring position. Five for 13 is um, all right in the game. You scored eight runs, but that's still not terrific. And then the other game, you were 0 for 6 that they lost 4 to 0. So don't you think those two things, picking the ball on the field and being able to actually be more consistent with runners on base is the big things the Phillies need to fix to stay more consistent this season? Absolutely, without question. I agree. And I think like you, you brought up a good point. Last series, yeah, to pick the ball better. I think that's something because of how recently the defense has been bad. I think it's something that's been a little overblown this year. I was looking at a lot of defensive numbers today. I mean, you know how much of a stack I am. I'm sure everybody na- by now who watches the show knows how much of a stack I am. And I don't know if you know this, but we're actually pretty high in the top half of the league and defense, the categories right now. And I think that, again, is – so I think that is a little bit being a little overblown. But like you said, this last series. So, like, in terms of that, like, the Phillies are – I think they've committed the seventh fewest errors in the league to, to date this year. I think they have the – I think it was the eighth best fielding percentage overall in the MLB. And then they have the tenth most assist on the year. So I thought that a lot of those were Oh, you're spot. It's you, you. They've been good this year fielding overall. It's just you committed, I think it was six errors in one series. Yeah. So obviously, another, consistency bias like you were getting that. And the other problem is, and, and this goes to the, for some of the things that aren't errors. Like, if you, and again, I, listen, I know people hate Chase Anderson and don't think he's all that good, but I think he was, he's gotten very unlucky this year. And I think that's kind of what you saw in that Sunday game. And not only you bring up having to pick the ball, I think you got to find the ball. I mean, listen, Chase Anderson, like, was he getting hit around a little bit? Yes, he was. But a lot of those, a lot of good outfielders would have caught a lot of those fly balls to, in the outfield yesterday that, uh, or on, on Sunday that, that the Phillies weren't able to catch. And, and I think it would have been a different game. Like if Bryce Harper's out there tracking out tracking fly balls instead of Kingery, I think there's two of them that are caught at least. I think there's one to uh, center field as well that wasn't caught. And then you had the Segura, whatever you want to call him, miscue in the infield where he kind of, I don't know yeah. if he <laughs> overplayed it or what, whatever you want to call it. He lets that he go. got so mad so at Girardi all, too. <laughs> all those runs end up being earned, but in, in reality, there's still a lot of fielding. Uh, there's some fielding mistakes down that Sunday. So I think, again, Chase Anderson gets charged for seven earned runs, but I think if you can really pinpoint it, I really think outside the two solo home runs, I don't know how many of those would have been earned if you charged those er- with, with errors. So to your point, yes, I think you do it overall, not only pick the ball, but I think you got to find the ball better in terms of the defense and then on offense, you're absolutely right. You're, you're finding ways. I mean, if you look at the box scores, it's not like we're not getting hits. It's not like we're not drawing walks. You're getting base runners. You're having opportunities. You're just not getting them across to the plate. And I think that's something that I think part of the issue is you haven't had a team out there. Fully. Even like in the games having- that we score, though, it's more because of bunch hits, like doubles and homers, where like 5-13 yeah. for 13 is not that great of a number even with runners in scoring position, and you scored eight and lost, but you scored. So it's like even in those games, it's more you're fortunate. So that's why I think the big key word for me is in order to stay consistent, you have to go from being fortunate to actually being fortuitous and taking advantage of opportunities you get. Yeah, absolutely. And not only that, I think part of it, I mean, when you hear guys talk about, especially in the bullpen, you need to know your role. You need to know where you're going to be. I mean, this team has been detrimented with adversity after adversity. I mean, first off, I mean, we all know the center field issues. You're on your fifth center fielder. So that's five guys already in the lineup right there that have been in different spots. Now you have Harper missing games. You have JT missing games. You have Gregorius missing games. Segura's already been on the IL once. Like, this team, this lineup hasn't had consistent. Like, I, I would be curious and I should have did this probably before, but I'd be curious to see how much our opening day lineup has, like, not played together ever since opening day or that opening weekend. Because in reality, like, if you think about it, this this team hasn't had the same guy out there, it feels like. And then, of course, you have Nap start yesterday's game. Not, nothing is Nap obviously, but then he goes down, and he can't yeah. or actually even get to start the game. He was a late-game scratch. 
So you have that issue. Now you have another guy coming in, and then you have Kingery get hurt during the game, and you got to throw out an injured Harper out there playing with his best ability. So, again, and that's the same thing. People are going to rip on Girardi, but I think what Girardi's done this season to keep this team afloat right now where they're at has been undervalued and underrated just because of all the adversity that this team has gone through. Yeah, there's been a lot of different stuff to Phillies, obviously, most so injuries. Uh, they haven't had um, too much of an issues with COVID, where baseball actually hasn't been too much bad since it started later in the whole COVID uh, getting better in the well, our country, at least, train. Um, but I think now we talked enough on the overall issues of the team. We can now move into the series where, yet again, uh, the Phillies should have advantage, even though TBD is pitching game one uh, for the Marlins. You know, that that, that always uh, Cy Young level TBD. <laughs> um, against the Phillies, usually it is, though. Like that Anthony Especially K. With... That pitched pretty good in four innings. Anybody they, the team never has seen that's just randomly thrown in that they don't have a scouting report on normally gets the Phillies number for at least four innings. <laughs> Especially with, I don't know if you're thinking about the same person I am, that might be the guy that gets called up for that game if they really are TBD. Who? I believe, I don't think he's hurt. I think he just started in the minors, but if it's still TBD for this long, I wouldn't be surprised to see Sixto Sanchez go tomorrow. I could see him getting the oh, call yeah. up. And- Wasn't he because of um, getting his arm healthy or something? I forget what it was. Something like that. Like stretching him out or something like that. It might have been. But I'm just saying, like, that's something to be aware of. I mean, you're going against Sixto Sanchez that's- tomorrow. That could cause some problems for us. Yeah, so. see, that would be a really good matchup, though, because we have Zach Wheeler. Um, it wouldn't be a great matchup for the Phillies' bats, but just from a f- pure pitching perspective – uh, that would be a very good matchup because we have Zach Wheeler going and you would get to see two fireballers with great stuff and Sito Sanchez and Zach Wheeler match up against each other. But that's a really good point. I wasn't even thinking of Sito because um, I just thought I saw something like they're trying to stretch him out. But he should be ready by now because the minor league started. I would think you only need one game to really get uh, into your groove there and feeling good. Speaking of feeling good at the minors, did you see Spencer Howard at eight strikeouts? Absolutely. I think that's yeah. big. I mean, whether I think he's got to get caught up, whether you're going to put him in the pen or if you're going to keep make him a starter and move maybe Chase Anderson to the pen or something. But yeah, I think uh, you got to call Howard up. He's tearing it up down there. But real quick on Sixto Sanchez. So what happened was it wasn't uh, necessarily arm issues. He was just trying to get his arm stronger because he, he was a late addition oh. to the spring roster because he started spring on the COVID uh, list so he was kind of a late start to his spring so he's kind of just still warming up getting ready so this was as of april 21st so almost a month ago so i think yeah i think he'll be called up sooner sure. rather than later at this point so it really could be him tomorrow we'll see we'll see if we're able to find anything on that uh anytime soon but don't be surprised if we're watching the the former philly prospect going to go up against wheeler tomorrow and listen he did pretty well last year yeah, he did. That's a hell of a matchup. The, I mean, I think the Phillies, I think that'll be a low scoring game. If that ends up being the matchup, I think that'll be a pretty low scoring pitcher uh, or any game because you got Wheeler, who's been locked in this year. He's three and two with a two eight five. And then you got Sikto, who even if he's only able to go like, say, four and two thirds or five innings max, which is his first start back up, you're still going to get the high pivotal um, game changing Sikto Sanchez in those frames. So, I think this is a game you got to try to do like Crux says sometimes, take advantage of the early mistakes. And I think that's what's going to set apart in the first game who's able to win if they do go with Cito Sanchez. If they go with somebody else, I think by default the Phillies have an advantage in game one because you have Zach Wheeler on the hill and no other extra pitcher on the Marlins other than um, Sanchez, who's down just to work on his arm, like you said, um, is going to match Zach Wheeler. So I would say that. I don't know if you agree with that, but I would say as long as they don't have Sanchez, we definitely have the advantage. If they do, it's just about taking advantage of the early mistake. Whatever team tends to do that, that'll probably be who's able to win game one. I agree. I mean, unless they have some other guy in the minors waiting to, to play that I'm, we're not aware of. I would say, yeah, if it's not Sixto Sanchez. And you know what? Even at this point in Sixto's career, I think I'm still taking Zach Wheeler for a slight advantage. But, no, if, if Sixto can't go, absolutely. I think Phillies should have a big advantage. Obviously, coming back home, it should be able to do some damage here tomorrow or on Tuesday night. So, I, I'm excited for this series. I think you can take advantage of a few things here. But, no, yeah, I think assuming if it's not Sanchez, you got to take game one here. Yes, 
Yeah, we, we don't want the amount of it not Sanchez. you got to take game one of it. Sanchez, you're going up against one of the more electric guys in the game. So I have to see what happens there. It's talking about going up against one of the more, I don't know if electric is the word, but one of the more finesse, um, nice guys to watch that's kind of like watching a fine wine type of pitcher, kind of like what people thought Andrew Heaney would develop into years ago, is uh, what Tyler Rogers is doing uh, currently. Uh, for the Marlins, and he's on my fantasy team. But, you know, uh, Trevor <laughs> Rogers, not Tyler Rogers. There's too many Rogers in the freaking MLB. Rogers Trevor Rogers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Trevor Rogers is the one that's doing great for the Marlins. Uh, he's 5-2 and two with a 184 and 57 strikeouts already. Eflin's obviously been very good as well, 2-2, two and 386, two, 51 strikeouts. So this is going to be another very good pitcher's battle, but I'm honestly – um, Eflin's been really good, so I think this will be another low-scoring game, but I'm concerned with how inconsistent we've been with runners in scoring position with a guy we don't we haven't seen that's been this good as a rookie because the Phillies already just struggle against guys they don't see as a rookie to begin with, even if they're not that consistent, where this guy right now, if the season stopped, would probably win the rookie of the year. And we're going up against him when we're not that consistent and not that healthy, potentially, too, uh, with runners in scoring position. So that that second game, even though we have Eflin, just because of that nugget really does concern me. You know, I hear you. I think uh, if I remember correctly, the Phillies hit uh, Trevor Rogers fairly well last time they played him, if I remember correctly. So obviously it's a different year and obviously anything can happen. But I'm pretty sure last season we got to him a little bit early on and chased him. So hopefully you kind of see something similar there and get some of these guys out. I think, uh, listen, I think Eflin likes pitching it in CBP, and I think it's exciting there. And I feel know. like that might be, though, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just kind of what I was listening to the John Boy show where that Plouffe's on, and Trevor Plouffe brought it up where he hit well off of Noah. So when he came to the Phillies, he brought that up to Noah, and he's like, well, yeah, that's before I got good. <laughs> so I feel like if you ask Trevor Rogers. He'll be like, well, they, they they jumped on me before I got good, where this is the year. He only pitched, I want to say, like a handful of innings last year. This is the year is like still, I think, considered a rookie amongst many of the guys that are still considered rookies this year because of the shortened season. So I feel like that'll be a difference of, do the Phillies going to be able to match the new Trevor Rogers? where last year, yeah, if he was pitching to like a high four ERA or something like that, I will 100% say they're more likely to do so. I'm just concerned with how this guy's kind of come in and been a very good location artist and kind of being what pitchers used to be and showing that as long as you still have the great stuff, you can do that. Just be a no, good pitching artist. Like. I agree with you. I mean, I was just saying, like, maybe it can give the Phillies team confidence as a whole going into there. And, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting. I Funny, uh Cousins with uh, one of the Philly kill- playoff killers. I don't know if you know this. I was on, I'm on his page on MLB.com, and it has their you know, relationships. Side track real quick. Cousins to uh, the good old Cody Ross. Oh, Trevor Rogers is cousins to Cody Ross. And so it says relationship cousin of Cody oh, Ross. Well, we're definitely going to lose the second game then. Okay, well, <laughs> well, well that settles that. Okay, well, well we, can so, just, we can just pencil we that. We, we can just pencil that in as an L. <laughs> right now, nah, but yeah, I, I think it's like you said. It, these first two games are probably gonna be pretty low scoring. I think this is the you could see some pretty good pitching duels. We'll see what the weather holds and whether the ball's carrying out or something like that for when the bullpens take over. But in terms of these starters, I think you're gonna have a lot of low first uh, first five six innings of the game, and we'll see how it transitions. That's actually a good point. Speaking of the weather, it's supposed to be really hot this week. Okay. Um, it's supposed to get pretty warm up here. In Philadelphia, so I feel like the ball will probably travel well. Um, for example, tomorrow the series that goes Tuesday through Thursday, we got 80 degrees, no really chance of rain. Um, then it's going to be lowest of 53, 87, lowest of 58, then 87, lowest of 58 again. So it's probably going to be pretty good hitting weather. It's just going to be can you actually barrel the ball up? when guys are on base. That's what's been so frustrating about the Phillies this year. It's not that they can't barrel the ball up in different points of the game. It's just for some reason, it's like they're turtles. And whenever anybody gets on base and you're in a really good chance, it's like, oh, let me go into my shell real quick. Like, like that's why it's really annoying. 
because they do barrel it up, get on base, and then when people are on base, they just don't get to the next step, which is executing and becoming fortuitous and actually taking advantage of situations rather than just becoming fortunate and hitting a couple home runs, which is what gives them a lot of the runs in the games. They actually scored more than five or four runs this year. Yeah, I think on top of that, honestly, and before we get into the final game here shortly, I think, honestly, the biggest question of the whole series is who's going to be out there playing at this point? Like, is Harper healthy enough to play? Is Dee healthy enough to play? Is JT going to be healthy enough to play? I, I mean, apparently Kingery left the game early last time with an injury. Is he going to be healthy enough to step in? Obviously, he hasn't done much. Is Andrew Knapp going to be able to step in with him being scratched? It's like, at, at some point, you might just, even if they're not, like, going to be out for a while he might just have to throw somebody at on the il just so you can call somebody up somebody up in these kind of games because you got away with it in toronto because obviously you have the dh but could you imagine if that was an nl game and you started the game with only one bench guy and then you lose him right before yeah. the game and that's in that true. case now you, you basically have to have a pitcher hit the entire game so you're already at a disadvantage so that's why i'm honestly surprised we didn't see any moves here uh, this afternoon today, I thought you were going to see something just so you were ready. Maybe that's a good sign. These guys will be ready for tomorrow night. But we'll see what happens. But that's that honestly- or it could just happen tomorrow because it's not like our minor league site is far. It's just Lehigh Valley. So I'm not – yeah, I hope that is the reasoning. But I feel like just playing devil's advocate, normally they happen the day of game day. And I feel like you could just see as you wake up tomorrow, such and such is caught up, such and such is caught up. And you're like, sure. oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we'll have to see who those such and such. The next are. Nick Maton in the waiting. Yeah, yeah, maybe Simon Muziani's the next uh, Nick Maton in the waiting in the outfield. <laughs> you know, um, but no, nah, I think um, in this series, like we kind of been getting at the whole podcast, the key's going to be coming up big with runners in scoring position. Just based off of the last series, you got to get back to picking the ball like you were doing before the Blue Jays series in the field, and th- that's what's going to be able to put you over the hump because pitching wise. I like our pitching for this series. I just fear Trevor Rogers because you're going up against a guy that's really found himself now is like I brought up the Trevor Plouffe to Aaron Nola thing is like this is now when I'm actually good and know who I am. That's the game I really fear because the third game that we'll get into to wrap up our podcast and series preview of the Marlins and Philly series is Alcantara who hasn't been as sharp this year. He's only 1-3 and three with a 4.06 ERA against Vince Velasquez, who's all of a sudden figured it out, it seems, tentatively saying this still because we've been fooled and fooled again and fooled three times by Vince Velasquez already. But the key with this season is the last times we've been fooled, it was all his fastball's been good, his fastball's been good, he's getting people out, he's blowing fastballs past people. Now he's actually pitching more at least in my opinion, where he's throwing more off-speed pitches. He's mixing his pitches. seems like JT and Knapp finally convinced him, if you want to stick in this league, you got to change and actually pitch and become a pitcher and not just a thrower. And it finally seems like that's what he's become. Where in the past when he had success, he was still kind of just gunning it. I don't know what you see from that perspective, though. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something Ricky Batalco has always said for the last 10 million years uh, on the post-game show with Vince and with Alf Valence on other guys, too, is these guys need to trust their pitches more, and that's something Vince hasn't really done. So to your credit, whether it's the new pitching coach, whether it's JT, whether it's Andrew Knapp, whomever it was or is, they've clearly worked with him, and he's clearly finally trusting their stuff. I mean, you look at his starts since replacing Matt Moore in the rotation from late April to currently in his five starts. Velasquez has a 2.84 ERA. He's been allowed one run in each of his last three starts, pitching at least five and a third in all three of those starts. I mean, this is the best stretch of his career with the Phillies. I can't say what he's done with, uh, did with the Astros before coming over here, but this is definitely without question his best put together stretch with the Phillies. Obviously he had that one game against the Padres was his best game with the Phillies and he'll probably never top that. And if he does, If he does, that'll be a nice win for the Phillies. Let's just say that. But I think this is overall his best stretch with the team. And hopefully it's something he can continue. And obviously, honestly, coming into the year, obviously you take it Sandy Alcantara. But the way he's been pitching, like you said, he's struggled. Um, He's struggled so far this year. So you might have a little leg up there in this kind of game. We'll see. Especially, we'll see how the two games before that go. But we'll see what happens. His last time out, Alcantara gave up eight runs in an inning of third. So, obviously, he's going to be coming off a bad start. He's going to be looking for something pretty good. So, we'll see what he's able to do. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think if Sito isn't the guy in game one tomorrow, the Phillies have the pitching advantage in two out of three games as long as Vinny keeps trusting his stuff and pitches uh, like he's been pitching in his last four games in this game. And I don't see why he would all of a sudden veer away from that when it seemed like he finally has bought in on actually pitching and not just gunning it. So I feel like that is going to really benefit the Phillies. I feel obviously whenever you have Zach Wheeler pitch that, benefits your team so i think if uh sanchez doesn't go they'll definitely have to win that game if not i think the phillies have a good chance it's all about like we said taking advantage of the guys early you got to take advantage of the good pitchers mistakes early and whoever does that will win game one game two again for me as my wrap up my thoughts is the biggest concern just because trevor rogers right now is one of the best pitchers in baseball, let alone rookie pitchers in baseball, to start the season. So he found himself, the Phillies don't, haven't seen him in this degree. So I'm a little concerned about that game. Alcantara, I would really fear, but he actually is not as sharp um, this year, and Vinny's actually finding himself. So I feel like coming in, we should be able to win two out of three in this series. The problem is, I don't want to be disappointed, but I'm just going to say it. We should be able to win two out of three in this series, just at the fear of potentially being disappointed like I was in the uh, Toronto series. I absolutely should be able to take two out of three in this series. You're the better team than the Marlins. You're the better manager. You're the better team. Like you said, you have the better pitchers here in the series. I mean, there's no reason you shouldn't. And you're at home. There's no reason you should come out here and get. It's the Marlins, though. Phillies, Marlins. You're home. (laughs) I'd agree if it's in Miami, you struggled down there in Miami, but you're coming home. I think it's going to be a good series. I think it's going to be a lot of low-scoring, fun, close games. That's honestly, maybe not with the Phillies, obviously, because you want to see them put up a ton of runs. But like overall, in baseball, I love watching those uh, pitching duels. I think those are some of the best baseball you can watch. So we'll see. I, I think it's going to be some fun baseball, and hopefully fans aren't giving up on this team yet. And, I, and hopefully this park is able to still get full uh, a little bit. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, we're going in one game over 500 at 21 and 20. Hopefully the Phillies are able to take two out of three to be in a good spot um, after this series and be able to stay a pace with the Mets who just keep on uh, cruising, as you uh, stated before the podcast and we hopped on. But I think the Phillies, like we said, should be able to take two out of three. The pivotal things, and I know every Phillies fan calls into sports radio and says it says just – hit with people with damn runners in scoring position and just going off of the last series, pick the ball because we should be able to continue pitching the ball like we have been of late. And as long as that continues, if we do those other two things, we should be able to get two out of three in this series. I am Joe Borig. You can follow me at uh, – jeez, I forgot my Twitter <laughs> thing. You can follow me at JJ Borig 26 and then you can follow Andrew at AJ underscore Santangelo on Twitter and also follow Steel Flyers as well over there as me and Andrew are going to start doing some shows for Steel Flyers as well. So please follow that channel Absolutely. as well. That's all sports content over there for NHL, NBA, MLB and NFL. Everyone have a great, safe and pleasant week. Stay safe out there. Be well and enjoy all the great baseball around the league and especially our Phillies baseball. Let's win this series, Phillies. Thanks for watching the Philadelphia Phillies versus Miami Marlins series preview for Andrew, I'm Joe. Peace out and stay safe.